So today, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, why well, it's a holographic generalization of the Easton Knell theorem. So that's not how I usually think about this work. So it's kind of an experiment for me presenting it this way. But I figured that probably the Easton Knell theorem is more familiar to most of you than a lot of the other things I'm going to say. So I'm going to try to organize the talk around that uh, and see how it goes. So let me begin by reminding you that in physics, symmetry is like our favorite thing. Symmetry is what we spend most of our time thinking and talking about. Uh, for example, in the standard model of particle physics, uh, we like to talk about the gauge symmetry group SU3 times SU2 times U1 mod Z6. Sometimes people forget the Z6, uh, which um, just knowing this group and then knowing something about the structure of quantum field theory uh, tells you most of what you need to know about the three fundamental interactions in particle physics. So the SU3 is kind of the strong force, and the SU2 is the electroweak force. Well, really, the SU2 and the U1 together are the electroweak force. Uh, and then the electromagnetism is some combination of these two. Also, in Einstein's theory of gravity, general relativity, it's again somehow most of the content or a lot of the content of the theory just comes from this idea that you want to have a theory which is invariant under the group of arbitrary coordinate transformations. Uh, so again, the symmetry is kind of the starting point. So Einstein called that the equivalence principle. Um, also in condensed matter physics, uh, when uh, we study the phases of many body systems, to a large extent, we distinguish them by talking about their, diff their symmetry structure, what gauge symmetry and global symmetry is present, um, what subset of these are spontaneously broken. Uh, for example, if you, if you think long enough about the Ising model, uh, eventually you decide that really it's just the theory of a, of a Z2 global symmetry and whether it's broken or unbroken uh, by the ground state. Um, and similarly, if you think about superconductivity for long enough, although this isn't how it was first thought about, you realize it's the theory of a spontaneously broken U1 gauge symmetry, which is broken to Z2. Um, so, so, you know, all these things, right? Any, basically, any physical system, you, when you discuss it, you start by listing the symmetries um, and studying what happens to them uh, in whatever situation you're interested in. Now, in computer science, and I, I should say I'm not a computer scientist, so maybe not everything I say is right, but I'll do my best. Um, so in computer science, I think symmetries are less central than they are in physics. Um, they do certainly show up, but you know, when I come to you with an algorithm, you know, maybe the first question you ask is not, you know, what is the what is the symmetry group of this algorithm? Right? That's maybe not a supernatural question to ask. I mean, some algorithms make use of symmetry, but you know, it's maybe it's one of the one of the one of the tools in the toolbox. Uh, but that's it. Um, but there's an important exception in quantum information theory, which is this easton knill theorem. And hopefully I'm saying that correctly. Um, so the easton knill theorem says that no quantum error correcting code can have a continuous symmetry which so-called acts transversally on the physical qubits. So what that means is that if we have a physical Hilbert space, which is a tensor product of a bunch of independent degrees of freedom, which usually we think of as something like, you know, I don't know, uh, spins in a magnet or uh, superconducting crosses or, you know, whatever the, the fashionable things are these days. Um, and then we have some code subspace, which is some subspace sitting inside of this larger tensor product Hilbert space. Uh, and then the idea is that, well, if the code is good, then maybe one thing we might like it at least to be able to do is to protect against the erasure of any single one of these physical tensor factors, right? Like if one of the superconducting crosses gets uh, decohered, you know, or somehow maybe that's okay. As, well, certainly if we know which one got decohered, since I'm talking about erasures here. Um, and then what the theorem says is that you can't have a non-trivial representation of a continuous symmetry group, G, acting on the code subspace which has the property that it's realized just by the product of a bunch of representations sitting on each of the physical qubits, right? So like, say you have 10 qubits and you want to realize, I don't know, the group SU2, then you can't have just a copy of SU2 sitting on each of the 10 physical qubits and then have that act in a nice way on the logical space as a single U SU2 representation, at least not if you want uh, the code subspace to be protected against erasures of any one 
of the 10 qubits. Um, so the proof is, well, I mean, in my mind, to my mind, basically trivial. Um, you say that, well, since G is a continuous group, um, every element in the group is the exponential of some uh, element of the Lie algebra, which is, uh, so there are these, you have charges, and then you take some linear combination of the charges and exponentiate. So for example, for SU2, these, uh, these charges would be uh, traceless Hermitian matrices. Uh, and then you have some three-dimensional vec uh, real vector space of uh, three-dimensional Hermitian matrices, uh, traceless Hermitian, ma two-dimensional traceless Hermitian matrices. Um, and then because you want the action to be transversal, you need that each of these charges is a sum over charges which live on each of the physical qubits uh, separately. So, you know, the charge is a sum of a charge on the first qubit and a charge on the second qubit and a charge on the third qubit and so on. Um, that's, what it, that's what it means for the symmetry to act transversally. Now, um, since each one of these pieces of the charge acts only on one of the physical tensor factors, um, by erasure correctability, if we look at the projection of these individual pieces of the charge onto the code subspace, so this P is just the projector onto the code subspace. So if you sandwich it between two of those projectors, then you have to get something that's just proportional to the projector. So that's kind of what it means to be able to correct the erasure channel, right? It means for any operator on the thing that got erased, its projection to the code space has to just be itself proportional to the projection on the code subspace. Um, so. Uh, since this is a, just a sum of these guys, and this is a linear equation, it means that the charge, the whole charge also has to be something which acts trivially in the code subspace, okay? Um, now, so moreover, since the, the full symmetry, the exponential of the charge, also preserves H code, right, because we assume that it's something that acts within the code subspace, the symmetry, uh, then QA, the charge, must also, because, for example, we can just differentiate with respect to this theta, um, and so therefore we can exponentiate this equation to find that U itself also is just proportional to the, to the identity on the code subspace and that means that it's trivial. Okay, so that's the proof of the easton Canal theorem for the people who are coming in now. So therefore the symmetry must be trivial. Okay. Now today what I'm gonna do is argue that the easton Canal theorem has an important interpretation in ADS CFT, which maybe is something that's less familiar to most of you than uh, the Easton Kill theorem. Um, it rules out the possibility of having continuous global symmetries in the gravitational side of the correspondence. And in fact, uh, and this is why I use the word generalization in the title, um, in ADS CFT, the argument is going to extend also to discrete symmetries. So no global symmetries of any kind are going to be allowed. And I'll remind you that in the proof of the east kling theorem, we use the Lie algebra, so we use that the group was continuous. And in fact, there are, there are counterexamples in, discrete, in the discrete case. Uh, for example, like the, the three Qtrit code has a Z3 symmetry that acts non-trivially in the code space and can be realized transversally on the physical Qtrits. Um, so somehow, it, we're gonna have to use some special features of ADS-CFT to, to generalize the theorem to, uh, to discrete symmetry groups. And this confirms, um, at least within ADS-CFD, one of several old conjectures about symmetries in quantum gravity. Uh, and these are conjectures really that go back to the 60s, so there's some work by Wheeler. Uh, although Wheeler, he, I mean, he, he was sort of this philosopher guru, you know, he would have done well in Boulder. Um, so, you know, you read his papers and you kind of don't really know what, what to make of them, but well, one thing he says in these papers, which turned out to be correct, is that, is that you can't have global symmetries in quantum gravity. And there, there was a nice review that's uh, kind of more precise, maybe 10 years ago by Banks and Seiberg. And then the argument I'm gonna to present today is from a, a pair of papers um, that I put out earlier this year with Hiroshi Aguri. And maybe I'll say, so, the, so the, with these papers, there's a short paper and a long paper. And the, the data compression between the two is a factor of 35. Uh, which I'm pretty proud of. So I recommend you read the short one. <laughs> okay, so here's the plan. So first we'll talk a bit about 
what do we mean by global symmetries in quantum field theory? I guess not everyone here spends all their time thinking about quantum field theory or even any of their time, uh, so we'll try to keep it simple. Um, then I'll, well, if I were here two years ago, I would just be giving this whole talk about holographic quantum error correction. Uh, but now I'll assume you're all experts. Well, I won't realize, but I'll, 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 so I'll review a little bit, but I'll, I'll, I'll keep it fairly brief. Hey, John. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't need the review. Um, then I'll, uh, I'll give our argument for noble global symmetries in quantum gravity. And when I give it, hopefully the parallel to these Quinault theorem will be fairly clear. I mean, I'll talk about you know, what additional structure I'm using. Um, and then I'm, I'll briefly talk about something which I call long range gauge symmetries, which I'll explain why I'm talking about it when I get to it. Um, and I'll suggest that this idea of long-range gauge symmetries may have interesting applications in quantum information science. In some sense, it's a kind of a way around the easton Knell theorem. So, so you know, because of course, no-go theorems, you know, they're nice and all, but, you know, they're, what can you do with them? It just tells you what you can't do, right? So, so it's more fun to have some positive idea, you know, that where there are examples, and then you can play with it and see if you can do something. And so I want to end the talk on a positive note. Okay, um, so let's start. So here's quantum field theory for computer scientists. So the basic idea is you, you have some you know, system where we can think of a bunch of independent degrees of freedom which are arrayed in a lattice. Uh, so we have a tensor product Hilbert space over the degrees of freedom at each point in space. And so I, I drew a two-dimensional space here, but of course it can be any dimension. Um, and then moreover, the, well, the key thing is that then there's a Hamiltonian. So to have quantum mechanics, we need a Hilbert space and a Hamiltonian. Uh, and so in quantum field theory, the Hamiltonian will be a sum of terms which only couple degrees of freedom that are within some finite distance um, of each other on this lattice, say in lattice, you know, finite distance in, in units of the lattice spacing. Um, so, okay, so if I were a condensed matter physicist, that's all I would say, but then since I'm, I'm a high-energy physicist, I'll further say that then the thing we're really interested in is we focus on the set of states whose energy is finite and the limit of zero lattice spacing. So, so there's a lot of junk that's up at the, you know, whose energy is of order of the lattice scale, and that's usually not what we care about when we're doing quantum field theory. We want to kind of work in a limit where we take the spacing to zero and then see what's left over, and that's kind of the stuff that we really call quantum field theory. Okay, so quantum field theory in one slide. Um, now, symmetries in quantum field theory are somewhat constrained. So of course, you know, you know, probably you learned in you know, kindergarten or whatever that a symmetry in quantum mechanics is a you know, unitary operator that commutes with a Hamiltonian. Uh, in, in quantum field theory, that's too general. Uh, well, it's both too general and not general enough because actually, the, A, there are symmetries that don't commute with the Hamiltonian, uh, for example, Lorentz boosts. Um, and B, there are symmetries that do, there are things that do commute with the Hamiltonian but are kind of stupid. For example, you could take the projection onto the 42nd eigenstate of the Hamiltonian. Uh, that's a Hermitian operator, and guess what? It commutes with the Hamiltonian. Uh, but it's not very interesting as a symmetry in, in quantum field theory. So somehow the symmetries that are interesting in quantum field theory are symmetries that respect this local structure of the Hilbert space and the degrees of freedom. So in particular, um, say O of x is a local operator at point x, and u of g are the unitary operators which implement the symmetry on the Hilbert space. Uh, and so I'll assume that the symmetry is so-called internal, which means that it, 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 it um, preserves where you are in space. So then what we require is that if we conjugate this O of x by the symmetry, we get some other local operator which is sitting at the same point x, okay? If I remove the in internal, then we would have gotten a local operator that might be at a different point x, but either way, we have to get a lo you have to send local operators to local operators. And I'm gonna restrict to the case where they're at the same point, okay? And that's incredibly restrictive if you think about it, right? Like most uh, unitaries on the Hilbert space are not gonna do something even close to that. You know, they'll take stuff here and move it all the way over there and, you know, but I mean, somehow that, that kind of thing isn't use doesn't seem to be useful to think about. Um, now, um, if for any g other than the identity there is some O of x for which this is non-trivial, then we say that the symmetry is called a global symmetry. So that means a symmetry, you know, where you can see the full symmetry group just by looking how it acts on the local operators. That might not be true in general. There are, I mean, in fact, we will see there are other types of symmetry, including these long-range gauge symmetries that I mentioned, but also things called higher form symmetries. 
um, which act non-trivially only on non-local operators. And so then those wouldn't be called global symmetries. Actually, sometimes these ones are called, they're called generalized global symmetries, but okay, don't worry about that. Um, so I'm interested only in the ones where just lo right today, at least, lo just looking at the local operators, you know, you can see, you can figure out what's the entire symmetry group. You can see the, see it acting non-trivially on the local operators. Okay. Um, all right, so, so uh, okay, so that's a definition. Now, what are the properties that follow from the definition? Well, one of the most important properties um, is something called splitability, which is kind of a more formal version of what's sometimes called Noether's theorem. So Noether's theorem is the statement that if you have a global symmetry in quantum field theory, there's a conserved current. That's if there's a continuous global symmetry. Splitability is kind of a generalization of that, which works also if the symmetry group is discrete. So what is splitability? Well, what it says is that, basically it says that if you, you can define other, you can define operators which implement the symmetry only in a region, right? So say R is a spatial subregion and G is some element of the symmetry group, uh, then there's a unitary operator U of G and R where if we act on a local operator, then we get this O prime if the operator is located in the region R, but, but we just get back O again if the operator is located in the complement of the region R. So like in the Ising model, you know, you, you have some region R and you flip all the spins in the region R and you don't do anything outside, okay? Um, and so when, when G is continuous, there's an easy way to think about this U of G and R. So then you do have this Noether current and you can just integrate the current only over R to give you this operator that implements the symmetry only in the region R. Um, now in a lattice setting, so maybe that sounded mysterious, so let me make it sound obvious. So, so in a lattice setting where we have this tensor product Hilbert space, there's this theorem that you can prove. Uh, it, it's kind of a fun homework exercise to try to prove it, although there's also a proof in the appendix of our paper, the long paper, unfortunately. Um, so let U be a unitary operator on a tensor product Hilbert space um, where it has the property that under conjugation, it sends any operator which is non-trivial only, non only on one of the tensor factors to another operator which also is only non-trivial on the same tensor factor. So that's like saying that it sends local operator at point X to local operator at point X, right? Okay, then this U has to be a tensor product of U's which just act separately on each lattice site, okay? So in the language of Easton Knill, uh, to try to make a connection more clear, um, global symmetries have to act transversally on the lattice degrees of freedom in quantum field theory. They're somehow realized just as a product of use acting separately on each of the sites. And that wouldn't be true without this requirement that it preserves the local structure, right? So it's really this requirement that it sends local operators to local operators that tells us it has to be transversal. Okay, so let's try to draw a picture of that, right? So, so here's my lattice again. So say I want to implement the symmetry only on the red dots that are in the region R, right? Well, so what I do is I take the U for the whole space. I realize that it's a product of, of U's on the sites like this, and then I can construct this U of G and R by just taking the product over the U's which are inside the region. Okay, and that gives me, the, that gives me a unitary that implements the symmetry only in here and does nothing out here. Right. Okay. So, and yeah, I emphasize this works equally well for discrete and continuous symmetries, um, unlike Noether's theorem. Now, it's interesting that in the continuum limit, there can actually be some subtleties with this argument when the space is not, uh, the topology of space is non-trivial, uh, but I'll just restrict to cases where it isn't, so let's not worry about that, but you can read about it in our paper if you want to learn about it. There's some fun topology. Okay, so that's all I was going to say about symmetries in quantum field theory. Now you're all experts. Uh, now we can move on to ADS CFT. Um, and we want, of course, our goal is that ADS CFT somehow says that quantum field theory is equal to quantum gravity, and we just learned that symmetries act transversely in quantum field theory, so we're going to now try to somehow see what that tells us uh, about the gravity side of the correspondence. Um, so, okay, so let me remind you what does this correspondence say, right? It says that quantum gravity in asymptotically ADS space. Um, is equal to quantum field theory living on the boundary. So like here's some picture. So the asymptotically anti sitter space is like the inside of this can. So if this were like holding soup or something, then the quantum gravity is the soup. Uh, so here's us float, you know, swimming around in the soup. Uh, and time, time goes up, uh, time always goes up. Uh, so, and then there's some radial direction in the soup and then there's also some angular direction going around. 
and then I wrote g not equal to zero to emphasize that in here there's gravity. You know, uh, so g is Newton's constant. Um, whereas over here on the boundary, right, so now this radial direction is gone, we just have the time in the angular direction and, and there's no gravity. Okay, and then the claim is these two are equal. Okay, now what does equal mean? Well, I should say just a little bit about that. Um, so, so here's another picture of the correspondence. So this is what the geometry of a time slice of ADS looks like. So this, a, this Escher thing is like a reasonably accurate description. Um, well, basically, so the first, the most primitive way you can think about it is there's kind of an isomorphism between the Hilbert spaces. So every state that you could have on this time slice in the bulk through the map is sent to some state of this time slice of the boundary uh, and vice versa. Okay. Um, then, and th this one is very important. So if we take an operator which is local in the bulk, like say sitting here at the nose of the fish, and then we extrapolate that operator to the boundary. So remember we had this radial coordinate r here, and so the boundary is at r equals infinity. Um, so if we extrapolate this operator to infinity, we just move it all the way out to here, then the claim is what we get is an operator which is local at the point we moved it to in the CFT. So this is supposed to be an operator equation, like this equation in the bulk, this operator in the bulk de description is equal to this operator in the CFT description, like acting on all states in the Hilbert space. Um, okay, and then we can say a little bit more about how to interpret the states. So roughly speaking, uh, you know, perturbations of the vacuum, you know, little ripples going around in the fish here, uh, correspond to low energy states from the point of view of the boundary CFT, uh, and, and, uh, and very excited states in the bulk, which basically consist of sort of large black holes that have eaten some finite fraction of the fish, uh, correspond to high, high energy states in the boundary theory. Okay. All right, so, okay, that took two slides, but now you're all experts in ADS CFT as well. Um, okay, now to keep piling it on, so, and so in 2014, it was realized that this correspondence has uh, quantum error correcting properties. Um, so the basic idea, so to, to tell, tell you that, I kind of have to tell you what are the code subspace and what are the errors and so on, right? So, so the idea is we consider a code subspace, which is the states whose energy is low enough that there aren't any black holes. Right? So, so the states, to say, it's sort of roughly speaking, just ripples of the fish. Um, and then we interpret the local CFT degrees of freedom as the physical degrees of freedom of a quantum error correcting code, um, while the bulk excitations within the code subspace are kind of are the logical information of the code. Um, and then using standard properties of the correspondence, you can show that if you have access only to the physical degrees of freedom in a boundary subregion R, so that's some subset of the physical qubits, if you like. Um, then there's some subset of the bulk information you can access, which uh, is the bulk information which lies in something called the entanglement wedge of R. So here's what kind of a picture of what it looks like within a fixed time slice. So think about like, so this, remember the quantum field theory is living on the boundary. So you can think about it like a spin chain, say, just going around this circle here. Okay, and then the correspondence says there's an isomorphism between the Hilbert space of the spin chain here and the Hilbert space of whatever we can put in the interior here uh, with this extrapolate rule telling you how the operators line up. Um, so then what this error correction says is that if I have access to some subset of the physical degrees of freedom, which say is just these ones in this boundary region R, then, um, well, th there's this rule where I draw this line, which turns out to be a geodesic, uh, and then anything which is in between the geodesic and R, any information there, any operator phi of x, can be represented just using the CFT degrees of freedom here, uh, but something over here cannot. Uh, and in fact, this one is kind of in the entanglement wedge of the complement of R, and so I can represent it on the complement, so I better not be able to represent it on both because that would be cloning. Um, so this leads to some funny things. So I guess this picture I, I still felt like I had to draw. Um, so, for example, I can split the boundary into three regions, uh, and then, oh, oops, the text and the labels don't line up, sorry, A, B, and C are R1, R2, and R3. Uh, so, this operator in the center is not in the entanglement wedge of any R1, R2, or R3, but it is in the entanglement wedge for R12, R13, or R23. So, uh, so this is really the redundancy of quantum error correction, right? It's saying, like, you know, I, 
if I have access to any two of the boundary regions, I can access this information in the center. So it's, it's protected against the erasure of any one of them. Okay. So I, I could say a lot more explaining that, and two years ago I would have, but, but I guess now I'll, I'll stop here. I guess there was also a tutorial by Patrick Hayden earlier this week. Um, okay, so anyway, this talk is about symmetries, so let's get back to symmetries. Um, so as I mentioned before, there's been this long-standing conjecture uh, going back to uh, Wheeler the Hippie. He would resent being called a hippie, I think. He was a, you know, he wore, wore a tweed suit and was Republican. Um, it, it has been a, you know, there's this conjecture that in quantum gravity, uh, no global symmetries are possible. Uh, so the original argument, well, not quite the original argument, the, the sort of improved version of the original argument is based on black hole physics. So basically you say that if there were global symmetry, then we could throw objects which are charged under the symmetry into a black hole. Um, and then at least if the symmetry is continuous, um, if we throw in enough of these charges, we can store more information in the black hole than the, the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy formula allows, right? So the Bekenstein-Hawking formula says the entropy of a black hole is A over 4G. And so that's some finite number. And so if I could store an arbitrarily large charge in the black hole, then infinity is bigger than not infinity. Uh, and so that's a contradiction. Um, so that was one argument. Note, though, that that one actually only works if the symmetry is continuous. Also, in string theory, um, which is the only known theory of quantum gravity, which is a claim I'm happy to defend, maybe offline, uh, if anyone here has somehow thinks that there are other candidates and needs to be disabused of the notion. Um, so in string theory, there do not seem to be any global symmetries, either continuous or discrete. Okay, so that's sort of empirical evidence, if you like, for this conjecture, in the loose sense of the word empirical. Um, so these arguments, you know, I think they're indicative. Certainly most people, you know, have been convinced for a long time that this conclusion is correct, um, but they're not, well, I would say not completely satisfactory. For example, this one doesn't work for discrete symmetries, and uh, as I said, this one is just empirical, and who knows, maybe there is another theory of quantum gravity that we haven't thought of yet uh, where, where it isn't true. Um, so in ADS CFD, actually, we can do better, and so that's what I want to tell you about now. So indeed, um, say that there were a global symmetry, symmetry group G, uh, in the bulk of ADS CFT. Um, so well, it would, since the Hilbert spaces are isomorphic, it would have to be unitarily represented on the Hilbert space of the dual CFT. Um, and uh, well, since, uh, remember, global symmetries act locally on local operators, so this is true in the bulk, uh, but since, uh, as we discussed, the boundary local operators are limits of bulk local operators, this means it has to act locally on boundary local operators also. Um, and that means that um, it'll also be a global symmetry of the boundary CFT. So we start with a global symmetry, we send it through the duality, we see what we get, and you know, big surprise, you get a global symmetry of the boundary CFT. Um, now, as we discussed, uh, symmetries in quantum field theory are splittable, meaning that we can define these localized symmetry operators that implement the symmetry only on a subset of degrees of freedom, or if you like in your language, uh, trans the symmetries act transversally. Um, the claim is that these are inconsistent. Uh, and the argument is actually quite similar to Easton Canal. so let's see. So by assumption, there's some object in the bulk which is charged under our putative bulk global symmetry. A symmetry under which nothing is charged is not much of a symmetry. Um, then what we can do is we can consider the algebra of an operator that creates this charged object with these U of G and R's, which are the operators on the boundary that implement the symmetry. So remember, in the boundary, it's a global symmetry in a quantum field theory, so we can split it. So we have a, you know, a U of G R1, a U of G R2, a U of G R3, and so on. Um, and moreover, if we take the product of all of these guys, then we just have to get back the whole U of G uh, on the whole, sorry, the sigma just means the whole boundary slice. Um, maybe up to some edge effects where we glue the things together, but for this talk, let's not worry about that. Um, now, okay, here's the contradiction, get ready. So each of this U of G and R is localized at the boundary um, so it can only affect the bulk within the entanglement wedge of R, right? So like say U of G R3, it only reaches into the bulk this far, into this gray shaded region here. 
Um, but since our charged operator is all the way over here, it means that this u of g r3 has to commute with it because they're, it, because they're space like separated in bulk. Um, but actually, our charged operator is not in the entanglement wedge of any of the regions. So it has to commute with all of the u of g r's. Uh, and that's also true for the edge effects because those have even smaller entanglement wedge. Um, but that means that our, our charged operator in the bulk just has to commute with the symmetry operator, and that means it's not charged, right? Uh, to be charged means you don't commute with the symmetry operator. Uh, so that's a contradiction, right? Because we started assuming it was charged, and then we concluded it couldn't be charged. Um, and so note the similarity to Easton Knill, right? So we have the symmetry, it acts transversally on the boundary. Um, and since, uh, since the information is protected against the erasure of any one region, um, it must be that the symmetry is trivial. And it's really kind of the same argument. We just say each of the pieces of the operator has to act trivially, and therefore the operator has to act trivially. Um, and indeed, if the symmetry is continuous, you can really think of what I just said as just a geometric illustration of the proof of the easton Knoll theorem. It's really the same thing. Um, so, you know, that's kind of amusing, I guess, or at least for me. Um, but note, however, that the argument I gave also applies to discrete symmetries because um, this splitability discussion I gave in quantum field theory worked also if the symmetry was discrete. Uh, whereas we mentioned before, Easton Knill only works for continuous symmetry. So, so okay, what happened? Did I, did I pull a fast one or, you know, were, did Easton Knill miss the theorem? Well, uh, that their theorem holds more generally? Well, maybe yes, but also their counterexamples. Okay, so what's going on? Well, in fact, uh, in the argument which I d kind of gave to you too fast probably for you to notice, I made an additional assumption. And my additional assumption was that I assumed that these U of G and R's individually preserve the code subspace, that, which is not something that Easton and Knill assumed. And once I have that, then I can look at things like this, where I have some, you know, where psi and chi are code words, and then I act on them with some combination of u's, and then, and then I look at this commutator here, and implicitly I was saying that I'm allowed to view this as a matrix element of this operator within states in the code subspace, right? So, so then I need this thing where I act with some of the u's on the state to be something that stays in the code subspace, okay? Uh, which is not something, again, that Easton Canal assumed. Um, so is, okay, is that reasonable or did I, or did I trick you? Well, I think it's reasonable. <laughs> so let me try to convince you of why. So if psi is a semi-classical state, um, and uh, the state, well, the state u of g and r acting on psi will look exactly the same as the state u of g acting on psi, uh, for all the operators in R, because remember, U of G in R acting on operators in R is identical to U of G. It just implements the symmetry. Um, and similarly, if we look at the same state, U of G in R, uh, and we only look at expectation values of operators which are in the complement of R, well, then it just looks like we didn't do anything. Then it just looks like psi, right? That was kind of the defining property of this U of G in R. Uh, so we can think about it geometrically. So. Uh, so again, here's the, I have this time slice of the bulk, is this disk. Here's R, and here's R complement. So say we start in a state, w and here's this entanglement wedge of R. So now if we start in a state where, say, I don't know, where we have some spin pointing up here and also pointing up here, and then we act with U of G and R on the boundary, well, what has to happen is that this guy stays up, because I can diagnose this just using operators here. This guy flips down. I can diagnose this with operators here. So really we're seeing that it's just saying that the bulk is splittable. The symmetry in the bulk is also splittable, at least within these entanglement wedge. So, so this, you know, since, since U of G acting on Psi and Psi are both semi-classical states, and, and since what's going on over here and what's going on here both look exactly the same in, in this state as they do in one or the other of those states, then at least everything here and everything there has to be semi-classical. So the worst that can happen is that there can be some energy density living sort of in the vicinity of the interface between the two regions. Um, but it can't be too bad. And in particular, you know, if you're a little more careful about how you smear things out at the edges, you can argue that this energy density kind of only has finite energy. Um, okay, and so 
what I'm doing here is I'm kind of using the fact that there's structure within the HI, which goes beyond Eastkin and Knell. I'm kind of using that, for example, I can sort of shrink the region a little bit, and then it just looks exactly the same as in a state, which is nice. Uh, and so I wouldn't have had that structure in a general code. OK. Um, OK, so that ends the sort of negative part of the talk where I talk about what we can't do. And so now let's try to talk about what we can do, because uh, that's more fun. So. In ADS CFT, the boundary CFT is a quantum field theory with no gravity, and it's certainly allowed to have a global symmetry. So uh, um, what we just learned is that that global symmetry can't be dual to a global symmetry in the bulk, but it has to be dual to something. Uh, and you know, since uh, you know, I'm a physicist, so I think symmetries are always interesting, and so it must be dual to something interesting. Well, if, if you go and consult the master, um, what he tells you is that a global symmetry in the boundary is the dual to a gauge symmetry in the bulk. Uh, so that's what, he's, that's what the master says in his uh, sacred text of, of 1998. Um, but in fact, although he's the master in this case, he didn't get it quite right because um, gauge symmetries in the way they're usually defined are really just redundancies of description. So this is a very deep fact, which may sound strange if you never thought about it before, but it's true. So I recommend sometime in your life, you know, when you have a little time, go and sit on a mountaintop and think about the meaning of gauge symmetry. And when you're done, you'll convince yourself that it doesn't mean anything. Um, and one way of seeing that is that you can have the same quantum field theory and there can be different ways of constructing it where the gauge group is different. And so how can it mean anything? It's just the same quantum field theory, okay? Now you might say, okay, well, come on, Daniel. Like in the beginning of the talk, you said, oh, gauge symmetry is so important and it sets up the standard model and so on. I mean, and it's true, but it, really what's going on is that there's something other than gauge symmetry that's going on there that's somehow in, part, sometimes correlated with gauge symmetry. And somehow that's the thing we really need to learn how to talk about. Um, and that we are sort of just getting at it in the wrong way by talking about gauge symmetry. So that's again, something I could give a whole talk about. Um, I think ADS-CFT is kind of a nice way of seeing that there has to be something that's more physical than a redundancy of description there because, because you know, the, in the CFT, it's a global symmetry, which is a real thing. And so it has to be dual to something real. And so the thing, so Hiroshi and I attempted to define the thing which it's dual to, which we call the long range gauge symmetry, uh, which is something that is more physical. So you know, than, than just the usual definition of gauge symmetry. Um, so unfortunately, I don't really have time to get into the details, although the details are in the short paper, so you, can, you don't have to look at the long paper. If you look at the five-page paper, they're already there. Um, but the basic idea is that a long-range gauge symmetry is a symmetry where instead of requiring that it act faithfully on local operators, we require that it acts faithfully on the endpoints of line operators at infinity. So the operators, we, so now we imagine we have a system where there's an asymptotic boundary. So we could have local operators, but we can also have non-local operators like lines stretching from a point here to a point in, at infinity or from a point at infinity to a point, another point at infinity. Um, and we define the symmetry to act on those operators. So this is kind of saying that this endpoint of the line carries a representation index i. If we conjugate it by the long range gauge symmetry, then it transforms in some representation of the long range symmetry group G. Okay. Now, the obvious example of this is Maxwell theory. So then this U of G is the exponential of the electric flux through infinity. So hopefully you know what that is. Um, and then the lines that are charged are Wilson lines. And hopefully at least you heard about that. But just in case you didn't, another example is the toric code, which, is, which we call Z2 gauge theory. <laughs> so uh, well, really it should be called Z2 gauge theory. I don't know why it's called the toric code. It's a ridiculous name. Um, uh, so the, but the, anyways, the, so the, the Wilson line in the, in the Z2 gauge theory um, is a kind of a line of poly Z operators. Uh, and the U of G, the symmetry operator, is a line of X operators at infinity. Um, and so if you think about it, like if you have a, a chain of Z, which runs into a chain of X, there's going to be a non-trivial algebra because Z and X don't commute. Right, and so the endpoint of the line of Z's transforms in the sign representation of Z2. Okay, so hopefully that one is uh, okay for most of you. Um, now, 
you might say, okay, so how does this avoid the contradiction that we talked about before? Well, it's pretty simple, actually. So, um, in the bulk, so the, the things that are charged now are going to be these things where you have like a charged point here, which is attached by a line to infinity. And now if you do this trick of splitting up the boundary into regions and thinking about what are these sort of pieces of the symmetry allowed to commute with, well, this endpoint of the line is always going to end up in one of them. So no matter how much you split up the boundary, you're still always going to be able to detect this endpoint of the line. Um, and so that's why uh, the having a long-range gauge symmetry in the bulk is consistent with the locality of the boundary theory where having a global symmetry would not have been. Um, and indeed, let me emphasize that um, all known examples of ADS-CFT have boundary global symmetries, which are dual to long-range gauge symmetries, uh, so it's good that we didn't find a contradiction. That would have been embarrassing. All right, so I want to close by um, thinking a bit about QIS applications. Um, well, obviously, there aren't going to be applications of bulk global symmetries because they don't exist. Um, but I think it's interesting to think about applications for codes where in the encoded space there's a long-range gauge symmetry, um, as there is in ADS-CFT, which is a code. So, so far, at least as far as I know, and please correct me if I'm wrong about this, there has not been very much study about this. Uh, so. In this so-called toric code, um, there is a long-range gauge symmetry, but it's in it's in the physical qubits, right? Like the 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 physical qubits are the are the Z2 gauge theory, and then the code space is just the degenerate ground state, right? So so that's a that's like a, in ADS CFT language, that's like having a gauge symmetry in the boundary CFT. But what I want is a gauge, a long-range gauge symmetry in the bulk gravity theory. So that's different than uh, what's going on uh, in the toric code. Um, and one interesting point um, along these lines is that, well, the time evolution of the boundary CFT is actually an example of a long-range gauge symmetry. So it's not one of these internal symmetries because it moves you from point to point. Um, but it comes from the diffeomorphism invariance in the bulk, uh, which is a gauge symmetry in general relativity. Um, so let me try to give a sort of vague cartoon of what I have in mind. Uh, at this point, it's just a vague cartoon, but I'll Forgive me, but I'll, I'll say it anyways. So, so here's the bulk, uh, and the idea is we have some object. Here. So say we have some state where we have some object kind of oscillating back and forth here in the center of the bulk. Uh, and we could try to store information in terms of what this object is doing, right? Like, uh, you know, how, for example, what is the amplitude of its oscillation, or how heavy is the object, or something like that. It's sitting in the center of the bulk. And what we learned from the fact that holography is an error correcting code is that if we think about this as a state of the dual CFT, this information is pretty well protected because in order to access information about what, what's going on in the center, you need to have something whose entanglement wedge reaches the center. Um, but actually that's not quite correct because in gravity, you can't really just have an operator sitting here which literally has nothing connecting it to the boundary because that's not invariant under diffeomorphisms. So to get, you know, since this thing has non-trivial time evolution and since time evolution is a long-range gauge symmetry, what you really need is that somehow this thing is attached to the boundary by some kind of line along the lines of what I was saying before for long-range gauge symmetry. In this case, it would be called a gravitational Wilson line. Um, and so that leads to this kind of funny thing where, where you have this thing that's well protected, but nonetheless it's able to evolve with respect to a local boundary Hamiltonian by taking advantage of the fact that the operator has this sort of gravitational tail attached to it. Um, uh, well, okay, you can have higher dimensional versions where they're attached, associated to surfaces and so on that run off to infinity. So those are called higher form gauge fields. Yeah, but for simplicity, I'm not talking about those. Um, yeah, yeah. You, the other thing you can do, which I kind of mentioned here, is that um, you can kind of smear the location of the line over space. And in fact, if you're trying to make a code, you kind of want to do that. Because if the line really ends at a definite point at infinity, then if I'm the adversary, I can just kind of come and mess up that point, and now, I'm, now you're dead, right? So if you want to you know, fight the adversary, 
it's better to instead use a dressing which kind of smears the line, which in electromagnetism would be something like working in cool something like working in Coulomb gauge instead of an axial gauge in electromagnetism, if you know what those words mean. Um, so in, in that way, um, you kind of, it's, it's very interesting. So you have, this op you have operators which can evolve with respect to a transversal Hamiltonian, you know, because the Hamiltonian is really a local boundary term in infinity. It's just the integral of T0,0 around the boundary, so it's transversal. Um, this information somehow is sort of protected but then also somehow is able to evolve under the symmetry um, in such a way that the algebra with local errors is small. Um, so somehow you can't, you can't do this in an exact setting, right? So yeah, yeah. So the easton knoll theorem is not wrong, right? You can't do this in an exact setting. But somehow holography kind of makes it clear that in an approximate setting you can do pretty well. You know, so it kind of suggests that maybe if you try to put epsilons in the Easton, you know, put error bars on the Easton Knill theorem, you might be able to get around it. Um, which, you know, maybe it's not obvious just thinking about Easton Knill, but somehow holography makes it obvious that, that, that that's going to work. Um, so, so somehow holography is doing something quite clever. So, you know, maybe is it like a new kind of code? Uh, and I want to emphasize that there was, there was some also, some ideas based on trying to, in infinite dimensional Hilbert spaces, trying to avoid Easton Knill, which came out of uh, uh, pa Hayden, Nizami, uh, Popescu, and Salton. Um, so I, I think it may be related to this, and I think maybe they also think that, um, although I'm not sure if they understand really the connection to asymptotic diffeomorphisms. Uh, may, maybe, maybe somehow understanding that connection would make it more clear how to use these results. Um, yeah, I sort of had this fantasy. I mean, I don't know much about metrology, but I was wondering maybe this would be good for metrology because you kind of have this thing here that's kind of just awesome. You know, the, what ADS likes to do if you put something in the center is it just kind of oscillates back and forth forever. So if you have this oscillation, which is kind of well protected, I don't know, it sounds like maybe it's some kind of clock or something. So I thought maybe it might be good for metrology, but uh, maybe it isn't. I don't know. I don't know much about metrology. Um, uh, it, it would certainly be nice to have a toy model of this. So, you know, ADS-CFT clearly does it, but, you know, I wonder if there could be some kind of tensor network or, you know, stabilizer code or something where you could build in this long-range gauge symmetry uh, in a nice way. Um, there are some initial attempts in this direction coming out of a group in Santa Barbara, um, but they, they kind of downplayed the symmetry aspect, which to me is kind of the whole point. So it seems there's still room... Uh, to somehow try and do this and kind of see how well you can do in terms of trying to circumvent Easton Knell. Um, okay, so that's it for me. So thanks for the invitation. Questions? Yes, Scott? Uh, yeah, so I'm uh, Daniel, I'm trying to understand the old. I can hear you anyway. Yeah, no, I know you can, but uh, maybe they should, okay. <laughs> so uh, otherwise they'd ask you to repeat the question. So uh, uh, I'm trying to understand the old argument for no global symmetries in quantum gravity that it would violate the Bekenstein bound. Like is it, is, is the point that if you have a global symmetry, then like I could sort of modify things, uh, uh, a number of uh, distinct things that would grow like the volume of a region and when the number of uh, disjoint modifications that I could make should only scale like the surface area. So let me say it in a more precise way. Okay. So start with a black hole that's neutral. Yeah. And, you know, and uh, now let's, for simplicity, let's assume the symmetry group is U1. So mm -hmm. say I just have some object which has charge one that I can throw into the black hole. Mm -hmm. Now, I just throw a whole bunch of those objects into the black hole. Mm -hmm. So there's information there in terms of how many I threw in, mm -hmm. which is now stored in the black hole. Mm -hmm. Now you might say, okay, fine, but when I threw all that stuff in, I made the black hole heavier, right. so the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy got bigger, right? right? Okay, but now, uh, now I stop throwing stuff in and I wait mm -hmm. for the black hole to start evaporating. Mm -hmm. So the key point is that since it's a symmetry, mm -hmm. the Hawking process mm -hmm. does not distinguish between plus and minus. Uh. So the net charge of the black hole does not decrease as uh. the black hole evaporates, but the mass does. Uh. And so eventually if I wait long enough, you know, no matter how much information I threw in, since it's all still there, it's eventually going to be bigger than Bekenstein Hawking. I see. And, and was that Wheeler's argument? Was that what he had in mind? No, Wheeler, that was not, yeah. Oh. I, I mean, I think uh, this one, yeah, I'm not, I, I don't know. All right, it's, all right. It's hard to, all right. uh, yeah. 
That's what he should have had in mind. Uh, I have two questions. First of all, should your argument also exclude quantum symmetries, right, with quantum groups? It looks kind of not impossible. Um, well, I, yeah, I don't, I don't totally understand quantum groups. I mean, so I'm not sure I can give it. I, let me say something definite. So something which I hear is sometimes called a quantum group is like these uh, higher katz moody symmetries of 2D CFT or Vera Soro. So those don't actually fit into my classica classification of symmetries because they don't commute with the energy momentum tensor. Uh, so that's, sorry, that's a, over the head of probably almost everyone. Um, so for me, it's kind of important to restrict, yeah, so roughly speaking, I don't include things like that. Um, yeah, I don't think, you, usually though things like that, they have an ordinary symmetry embedded within them, and so then if I can exclude that, then I can exclude them too. But uh, yeah, I don't try to exclude them directly. And the second question is, if you have this ADFC CFT model with a, with a fun, um, hyperbolic fundamental group, or you know, Grom, would that be visible in the bulk? Um, sorry, you mean like if I take a quotient of ADS by some discrete no, subgroup? No, you have a, a symmetry on the, the, the boundary, and that comes from the fundamental group of the boundary. And if this group has particular... Well, my boundary is a sphere times time, so the oh. fundamental group is empty. Yeah. Yeah, we could consider other things, and that gets, in, that gets into these questions of these higher form symmetries, and there's some interesting story there. But right, yeah, for now, for now, let's just say I, I work on the sphere times time. Hi, this may be like a silly question. You, you did a lot of work explaining a lot of terms, but I didn't know what you meant by a semi-classical state. Yeah, good. So yeah, that's a little bit subtle. So roughly, f so for my purposes, I just mean a state that doesn't have black holes. Usually people mean something a little bit stronger, which is that the, the geom so the metric in quantum gravity is an operator, and roughly speaking, a semi-classical state is a coherent state of the metric. So the fluctuations of the geometry are small. Okay, um, thanks. Yeah. Fascinating talk. Um, I have many questions, but I'll, I'll just say this one. Um, I, I find the discussion about, or you, you, your comment about gauge symmetries quite refreshing because I've been stuck with this same realization that they're both redundancies and yet they're claimed to be fundamental. Can yeah. you say a little bit more about the resolution of that or point to a reference for how we can well, yeah, so, th okay, look, so look I, more end, into that? So I think that, so that is explained in my papers with Hiroshi. Okay. Um, I think the, the real idea is this idea of the long range gauge symmetry. So the traditional definition of gauge symmetry is you start with a theory with a global symmetry and then you gauge the global symmetry by introducing gauge fields, yeah. right? But then the problem is, you know, that, so that gives you an integral if you like, because you're integrating over the gauge field and you can have two different integrands which have the same integral, okay? And that happens in quantum field theory all the time. So somehow defining, you know, defining a theory by saying what you had to, you know, defining a number by saying you did this integral to get it is kind of a weird, I don't know, way of, of defining it. So the way that Hiroshi and I organized the discussion was that was around these line, the algebra of these line operators and these asymptotic symmetries at infinity. Uh, so roughly speaking, in electromagnetism, the, the, in the ingredients are the, w we call them Wilson lines, but you don't define them by saying it's e to the i integral of A. Mm -hmm. You define it by saying it's some line operator whose algebra with the symmetry operator at infinity is uh, the right algebra for a Wilson line. So you, you, so you have the symmetry operators at infinity, you have the Wilson lines, and then there's the third requirement, which is that um, the dynamics are such that states which are charged have finite energy. So that's the thing I kind of didn't want to get into too much, but for example, like in, in QCD, yeah. there's an SU3 gauge symmetry if you look at the Lagrangian, but there aren't any states that are charged under SU3 because quarks are confined. So, uh, so we would say that's not a long range, so that's what the long range kind of means, so that's something oh. you might want to call a gauge symmetry, but it's not a long range gauge symmetry because there aren't any states that are charged. Uh, and, and the key thing, you know, the key thing to get something physical is to have states that are charged, right? Then you can't fight with that. You know, there's states in the Hilbert space and they transform. Um, 
Yeah, and so then, and then we have you know a long discussion about how somehow yeah giving various examples of this where you know, I mean I think I think actually the kind of Z two gauge theory with charged matter is a useful example for just kind of understanding the definition. So that one we work out in, unfortunately in our long paper, but that one we kind of work out and and see that it obeys all the properties of our definition. Um, Great, thank you. Yeah. So in, in, towards the end of the talk, you were arguing that um, the long-range gauge symmetries work because in the approximate context, Easton nil doesn't apply. Yeah. Um, but then why, in, for the earlier part of the talk, why not apply the approximate context there? Um, yeah, good. So the issue is that the, the contradiction that we had in the first part of the talk was an uh, order one contradiction. So, you know, we, I, we, we had something where the commutator of U and the charged operator had to be one, and, and we argued that it was zero. So if you put in some epsilons, it doesn't help. Um, I think it's still actually an interesting exercise to kind of, I mean, surely if you're sufficiently generous in what you allow to be approximate, you can eventually get around it. And in fact, it's actually sort of true because in, in string theory, there are approximate global symmetries in some sense, okay? And in fact, also in the real world. So for example, as far as we know, uh, B minus L, where B is baryon number and L is lepton number, is an exact global, well, certainly of the standard model, it's an exact global symmetry. Uh, and so we think the standard model, well, we hope, can be embedded consistently in some quantum gravity theory. <laughs> Otherwise, uh, I don't know, we should, you know, go work at Google or something. Um, hopefully no one from Google is here. <laughs> I like Google, actually. Uh, anyways. Um, uh, yeah, um, but, uh, yeah, so what, what, so let me try to say in a coding language what happens, how, how, how that works, right, and how the approximate global symmetries in string theory work. So what happens is that you have a symmetry which is approximate sort of to within epsilon acting on the code subspace, but then with just which is totally bad on states that aren't in the code subspace. Uh, so, and that avoids our contradiction. So in order for us to get, a, to get something that we can exclude, we really need a global symmetry in the entire Hilbert space, you know? So including like, you know, black hole, black hole scattering and like all these crazy things, you know, we're including a requirement that that respects the symmetry. So I think it's kind of interesting to think about you know, if you just say, okay, maybe only in states that don't have black holes, and then I'm willing to tolerate, you know, the symmetry up to error epsilon, uh, how well can I do? Um, yeah, I think it's an interesting sort of coding question, and it would be nice to sort of make sure that what you can get away with from a coding point of view is consistent with what we think we can get away with from a physics point of view. Um, yeah. Um, but somehow, yeah, some, right, so some, but somehow with the long, yeah, well, okay, let me leave, let me leave it at that. Well, sorry, let me say one more thing. So in the case with the long range gauge symmetry, the global symmetry in the boundary theory is exact, okay? Um, so, but what happens is that the, the fact that the, the information in the bulk somehow can be recovered from the erasures is approximate, uh, but the symmetry is exact. So that's kind of the difference. Okay, sorry. So I propose that we take further questions to the coffee break. So let's thank the speaker again.